Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's give God some praise this morning. Let us appreciate this choir. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Church, we are called to be God's children. God's love has been poured out on us through Jesus Christ. Fear and doubt are gone. Joy and celebration ring in our hearts. Come, let us raise our voices in song. Let us offer our hearts and soul to God in prayer and praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> the, road, the road to Emeritus was a well-known story in the Bible. It is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. And in this story, two disciples of Jesus are walking to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They are talking about all things that had happened to Jesus in the past few days. They are sad and confused because Jesus had been crucified. And as they walked, Jesus himself joined them, but they did not recognize him. He asked them what they are talking about. And they tell him about all the things that have happened. Jesus then began to explain to them the scriptures and how they all point to his death and resurrection. And as they are talking, they come to Emmaus. And Jesus asked them to stay with him. And they agreed. When they sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and break it. And at that very moment, their eyes are open. And maybe they looked at each other and said, hold up, wait a minute. Isn't this Jesus? Church, they recognized him. Jesus then disappeared in their sight. The story of the road to Emmaus it's also a reminder to the importance of faith, hope, and love. The disciples were sad and confused, but they were still faithful. They continued to talk about Jesus, even, through, even though they did not understand what had happened to the, him. They also had hope, because they believed that Jesus would rise again. And they loved Jesus, even though they did not see him. Each of you... There are three things that I want you to remember from this message, and they are faith, hope, and love. All three are essential for Christians. We need faith to believe in Jesus, even when we don't understand everything that's going on. We need hope to keep us going, even when things are tough, and we need love to show us the way, even when we are lost. The word of God for the people of God. Shall we pray? First of all, let's do a sermon, a scripture. Turn with me to Luke 30, 24, verse 35 through 48. Luke 24, 35 through 48. And I'm reading from the NIV version. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when they broke the bread. While they were still talking about it, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do you doubt the raising of, why do you doubt raise your mind? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Is it I myself touch me and see? A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see, I have. And when, they had, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they did not believe it, because the joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they said to him, a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophet, and the son. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. 
And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and raised from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things today. The word of God for the people of God. Shall we pray? Almighty God, our holy, our Father in heaven, we are grateful, Lord, that you have allowed us to come back into the house of praise just one more time. Father God, as we come today, Lord, we just pray that you might allow us to open our minds, our hearts, Lord, and even, Lord, open our mouths so that we can praise you as we want. Bless those, Lord, that will sing the hymns of praise today. Come, Lord, and lift up your man's servant today. Lift him up, Lord, high where he belongs. Give him a word, Lord. Somebody in this place this morning need a word from you. Come, Holy Spirit, for it is in your name that we pray and ask it all. Let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. 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 amen.
Take a moment and celebrate a good God. Amen. Can we can we celebrate a good God? Hallelujah. The Lord has blessed us again to see another day. Amen. And for that, that alone, He is worthy of all of our praise. Yes, he is. Friends, family, it is time that we would recite our commitment, our giving commitment statement together. So shall we prepare to do that? Shall we begin? Jesus says we should tithe and that we should not base our giving in tradition, but in faith and in the heart. So we come today to fulfill the commandment of the tithe and honor God. But also we give in faith and in love, just as Jesus commanded. Our commitment, Lord, we come before you today to present our tithe and offering to you in faith. We believe your word and we honor it by putting our faith in action through giving. We thank you for your blessing and we believe we will have what you promise. We sacrificially give by faith, believing that God will supply our every need. We willingly give with a cheerful heart believing and expecting the Lord to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings we don't have room to receive. God, we give believing you peace, joy, and stability. Needs met, no debt, answered prayers, money to invest, the means to leave an inheritance, businesses, tuition paid, overflow to bless those in need, favor, and open doors. We believe this by faith, 
In Jesus' name, let's give to other stuff. Amen. Amen. thank you. God, we thank you so much for the gift of a new day. We thank you, God, for this opportunity and worship to be able to give back to you what you have commanded us to do, oh God. And we pray, dear Lord, that what we've done today is a blessing to someone in need, that it becomes a resource to help extend the tangible hands and feet of Christ, that we might feed someone in need, clothe someone in need, provide hope to someone in need, Bless as only you can do. Multiply and be God. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Let everyone say amen. Amen, amen. amen. Good morning, Eastview family and friends. Just a few reminders that we have adult Sunday school every morning at nine, every Sunday morning at 9.30 in the small sanctuary. Tuesday at 12 noon, we have our prayer group via the mobile church. On Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., we have Bible study, again, via the mobile church. Thursday, I'm sorry, the thrift store is open every Saturday from 10 to 3 p.m. If you'd like to donate flowers, please see Deaconess Peggy Williams. All announcements should be in the office by Friday. So please call the office or send an email. You also do the same thing if you want to reserve space in the church you need to also call the office. Mark your calendar for tomorrow, Monday, April 15th at seven o'clock for our community room meeting, our church meeting, our, our council meeting. So tomorrow, Monday, April 15th, seven o'clock, please join us in the community room for our council meeting. 
on April 28th, right after church service on that Sunday, we will have our congregational meeting. And also that will be held in the community room. All members are asked to participate for both the council meeting tomorrow night and for the congregational meeting. We have a book discussion it will be taking place April 27th. That's a Saturday at noon. This month's discussion is Worthy, a memoir by Jada Pinkett Smith. A detailed email has been sent out or will be sent out. Continue to pray for our sick and shut in. Ruth Goldston, Michael Yates, Charles Burkett, Yvonne Burkett, James and Minnie Marshall, Beverly Toll Howard. In our midst, we have Sharon Jefferson, but still keep her in prayer. Also, Shirley Burton. Continue prayer for Pat Hill and Ruth Hayes and any member that we have that you haven't seen, please continue to lift them up. Keep Sharon Curry and Beverly Toll Howard in your prayer, special prayer, because they both lost their husbands, so continue to lift them up. Do we have any birthdays today? Amen. Well, eat what you want to eat today. <laughs> you gonna throw it out? Okay. <laughs> Do we have any anniversary? Oh, Chris. Happy birthday, Chris. Any anniversaries? Okay. The flowers on the altar today are dedicated to my mother, Gloria Price, giving you your flowers while you can still smell them from the Odins and Hawkins family. Okay. If you are a visitor, would you please raise your hand and an usher will come by and give you a welcome card. And if you can, please turn them in when you leave service today. And if you're sitting next to someone or near someone that seems to be a visitor or just someone, just wave at them, speak to them, you know, say hello. That concludes our announcements for today. Thank you, Ms. O, for those announcements. I just want to follow up very quickly um, on a few things. So as you all know, um, our, we are approaching the month of May, uh, which is Mental Health Awareness Month. And every year, uh, for the past two years, um, during that month, in conjunction with our spring revival, uh, we have partnered with a mental health agency to be able to donate resources uh, to someone uh, that may need therapy, want therapy, but cannot afford therapy. Uh, this year we are doing something a little bit different, uh, but still partnering nonetheless. On Saturday, uh, May 18th um, at 10 a.m., um, all of the men um, of Eastview will, will meet um, today actually after service. So I need all the men of Eastview to meet me for a few moments in the, uh, in the chapel. But Saturday, May 18th, We'll kick off our mental health um, initiative for the month of May um, at 10 a.m. here at the church. We will gather um, first with breakfast and we will have some presenters. Uh, one will be from the Alzheimer's organization. Um, another will be from Skid Stopping Cancer in his tracks with Cleveland Clinic. And then our main presenter for that day will be licensed therapist Eric King from Mental and Emotional Wellness Centers of Ohio. Um, and again, um, there's, a, there's a program that this particular agency have that's centered around six topics concerning mental health. Um, and again, you all know my heart. I talk about this um, on an ongoing basis, um, especially in the black community where that has be, that traditionally and historically has been a topic that we've continued to sweep under the rug. Uh, but I believe being a part of this uh, millennial group, right, that we said no more, no more. Uh, mental health has ravished a lot of our families, a lot of our community, even in some of the things when we talk about uh, prison sentences, 
and those who have gone to prison uh, who really needed mental health care. Amen, somebody. Uh, so again, um, our church um, is, is, I would like to say, one of the churches that's leading the way in this mental health initiative. So we'll kick off uh, May 18th, and then Sunday, May 19th, Pastor Kyle Early, the founder of Mentally Mangled, will be here uh, that Sunday morning to preach and teach on that subject. And then that Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, May 21st, we'll have a one-day revival. Uh, Reverend Dr. Napoleon Harris IV from Antioch Baptist Church will come and preach that Tuesday. So um, put this on your calendars. I, I, I need this, this church packed, especially that Tuesday, as we culminate, um, again, the month of May, centered around mental health. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. Um, also, too, um, on the 28th of this month is, is Purple Sunday, uh, where I'm encouraging all, all members to wear purple as we acknowledge um, and join in the fight against Alzheimer's. We'll have Pastor Frederick Knuckles, he'll be dropping by some information and we'll talk more about that. But again, these are pressing topics, um, not just in a general sense, but when we talk about the black community, amen? And again, one of the things I truly believe God has called us, the black church, to be a resource to our community to, to aid and, and provide hope in tangible ways that we all might be better. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on and bless God as the choir comes again. I'll do it next Sunday. Next Sunday.
We all just sing that together for a few seconds. Come on, just worship God in your own way. Don't worry about your neighbor or who's looking at you. Even if you can't sing like like some others can sing. Can we just can we just open our mouth and just love on God for a few moments? I know some of us have had a hard week and some of us are tired, exhausted. But can we just take a few moments and just just praise and celebrate a God that woke you up again this morning and bless you beyond what you deserve? Oh, come on, I can't hear y'all. Come on, can we open up our mouth and just sing? One more time, come on, one more time. All the glory belongs to you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. Hallelujah. Yeah. All the glory belongs to you. God, we've come today. We've come today to celebrate you.
despite the present circumstances that we are wrestling with. God, we've come to give you glory because you are worthy of all of our praise. You're a God that sits high and looks low. You're a God that holds the whole universe in your hand. You're the same God that put food on our table and clothes on our back. You're the same God that healed our body when doctors had washed their hands and said there was nothing more they could do. God, you're the same God that gave us strength to walk past the casket of a loved one and still keep on treading forward. So God, that's why, that's why, that's why. That's why we've come to celebrate you. That's why we've come to magnify you and to give you glory. To lift you up. To show our appreciation. And God, I'll tell you this publicly. If don't nobody else show up to the house of God. Don't nobody else praise or wave their hand, open their mouth. You've got one here in me that will cry out from the depth of my soul. God, you are worthy to be praised. Yes, Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for allowing your precious spirit to rest in this place. Now, God, do what only you can do. Speak. God, we didn't come to hear a word from Jeremy. We came to hear a word from God. Because the reality is many of us are wrestling with life. We can't afford to just hear frivolous, empty words. But, God, we need to hear from you today. We need some direction. We need some clarity. We need some hope and some encouragement. We need a reason to keep on living. So speak as only you can. Have your way in this place. Save someone. Change someone's heart. Work on someone's character. Be God. It's Jesus, in Jesus' name we do and pray and ask this prayer. Let everyone say amen. 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 You gotta excuse me, but I feel a little bit better now. Amen. Holy Spirit calls our attention, church, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, commencing at verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, commencing at verse 16. get that just say man if you will the Bible says from now on therefore we regard no one from a human point of view even though we once knew Christ don't miss this church from a human point of view we know him no longer in that way so if anyone is in Christ there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You may be seated. For just a few scattered moments, church, we want to dive into this dialogue from this thought through a different lens, through a different lens. On May 8th, 2024, many of us, because of Ohio being in what astronomers call the line of totality, we witnessed one of the greatest sights nature 
forwards us. That day, many of you know what I'm talking about, that day we watched the beautiful eclipse of the sun. Sight that we haven't seen in Northeast Ohio since 1806, and according to Cleveland Museum of Natural History, a sight we won't see again in Cleveland until 2424. And if the Lord comes up with some type of medical intervention, uh, many of us won't be around to see it. Amen. <laughs> now, I, I have to admit, church, um, I wasn't the most excited about witnessing this, this phenomenon and really didn't know what to expect. Uh, but my wife, on the other hand, uh, couldn't stop talking about it. All she kept repeating for the days leading up was, I got glasses. The eclipse starts around 1.58 p.m. Totality happens around 3.15 p.m. It will last over three minutes. I mean, she was, she was excited. She even knew that the eclipse would finish around 4.29 p.m. She was excited. And my spot response every time was, great. <laughs> total, total solar eclipse, yay, you know. Um, and this is why, church, if I'm being honest, this is why I was so shocked to learn that our city was preparing for, for 200,000 visitors to travel this way to see the total solar eclipse move across North America, passing over Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Monday, as the time neared for this once-in-a-lifetime show, me, Bree, and Riley found a nice spot under the canopy in our complex. And after getting acquainted with the neighbors, put on our protective eyewear as a part of, of the safety protocol. Now, after securing my solar eclipse glasses properly on my face, I began to look around and with confidence and the audacity, I said out loud, I can't see anything. <laughs> uh, to which my subtle and hilarious wife responded, uh, you have to look toward the sun, genius. <laughs> and after sharing a few laughs, I was then mesmerized and captivated but what I was, by what I was witnessing. I was at a loss of words I, as I watched the moon pass between the sun and the earth, completely blocking the face of the sun to only see the sun's corona, the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere. As I stood there almost paralyzed in thought, watching darkness pull the shade down over the sky and the stars come out to play early. It made me think to myself, there has to be a God somewhere. Amen. Has to be a God somewhere. Nevertheless, a few minutes had gone by and the moment had passed. And it was then while we were en route headed to get ice cream, as I'm reflecting over what my eyes had just seen, that I realized don't miss this, the only way I was able to witness the miracle and phenomenon of a total solar eclipse was because I was looking through the right lens. Right. Lean in, church. That's right. That's right. How many times have you completely missed or misinterpreted God and or life because you were looking through the wrong lens. The wrong lens. You said yes when you should have said no. The wrong lens. You, you thought it was the Lord, but it was really your insecurity, self-ambition, or the fear of failing that you redefined as passion the wrong lens. You settle in life when God created you to accomplish so much more. Or, church, a situation arose and you thought it was at some fault of your own, but, you, but it was really God stretching your faith, the wrong lens. You, you assume the feedback you received was 
jealousy or hate, but the Lord has just put somebody in your life that was actually holding you accountable, but you didn't recognize it because you were looking through the wrong lens. Or you mistakenly accepted what hasn't manifested in your life as denial, and God was just telling you it was delayed. It's the wrong lens. And I get it. I get it, church. The busyness of life is such a huge distraction that we often attempt to see God, how he is working in our life, or what he is not doing. We attempt to see clearly all of that through the lens of our bank accounts, through the lens of how many degrees we've earned through the lens of our popularity on social media, through the lens of the house and neighborhood we live in, through the lens of the many things we can afford, or through the lens of comparing the details of our situation to someone else. Nonetheless, church, there was good news to consider today. When we look through the lens Calvary has provided us, the lens of reconciliation, or in other words, when we keep our focus on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, it provides for us a different perspective. Do I have some help right around there? When, when your heart, mind, and soul has given God's only begotten Son your full attention, you see things differently. When you look Through a different lens, your eye is keen on details like the Lord's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. When you look through a different lens, you notice that sometimes God opens doors that look like they should be closed and he closes doors that appear as if they should remain open. When you look, church, through a different lens, you know a rock and a hard place is the Lord's workstation to do the impossible in your life. When you look through a different lens, you believe that despite the chaos and craziness we see unfolding across the globe, the Lord is still protecting, he's still providing, he's still saving, and he's still redeeming. You look through a different lens, you know that bad, that the bad news at the doctor's office, turbulence at home, anxiety concerning various circumstances does not exempt you from the possibility of resurrection. Just like Jesus called Lazarus from a cold grave. When you look through a different lens, you know the Father is able to speak the word and life has to come forward in your situation. You look through a different lens, church. You can look at a financial report, see how the expenses outweigh the income and still rest at night because you know that the Lord is going to make a way somehow. You may not know when. You might not know or have all the particulars of how, but because you've seen the creator take the moon and position it in between the sun and the earth, turn off the lights just to turn them back on a few minutes later, surely God can pay the bills. Church, I believe Paul was looking through a different lens in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, when he said, but my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And I wonder, do I have any testimonies in the house this morning that when you look back over your life, you didn't always see it, but God has changed your prescription. And when you look on back over your life, you can see how God has made a way out of no way time and time again. Is that your testimony today? Is there anybody that can just tell God, thank you because you gave me a new outlook and a new perspective on life when I didn't know how the way was going to be made, but somehow the Lord made a way. Yeah, he made a way. Henceforth, church, henceforth, 
that left to wrestle with this, dig through this relevant question, what do we see differently peering through the lens of the cross? I believe this text teaches us that those of us who recognize that we belong to Christ and by way of his love were bought with the bloody selfless price of reconciliation now see differently our savior, our neighbors, the newness of our days, Father God who wrote and executed the plan of salvation, our life and the ministry the Lord has entrusted us with. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the screen turns back on. Paul the apostle has just finished talking about treasures in clay jars. In a way, he is drawing a conclusion about what he just mentioned regarding the ministry of the new covenant. Reemphasizing, if you will, what he just said in chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Doing this, he compares the human body to a tent or temporary dwelling that has the ability to be destroyed by death. And then he juxtaposes it to a house, a solid dwelling, like the house prepared by the divine contractor for us in heaven, a, a construction not engineered by human hands. Not, not suggesting that our tent or earthly bodies are of human design, but rather Paul seemingly is making the point that our current address is dissolving, whereas heaven is eternal. As the apostle considers the likelihood of death, he expresses this hope or desire for the coming of the Lord in which he will be clothed with immortality. Showcase the extent of his hopefulness, he uses language like groaning, longing, and burden to display his sense of confidence and assurance of leaving his present body behind and entering the preferred presence of God. Nevertheless, church, Paul is not distracted, but goes on to say, whether still in this body or evicted from it, the one and only aim is to please the Lord. This confirms to us that, that the apostle was not simply passively awaiting what happens next, but is steadily living and serving, pouring out him self as a drink offering because he knows that one day we'll have to give an account before our father. Paul then moves on from talking about the judgment seat to fearing God. Not as a terror but to have a great respect or very high esteem for the Lord. Respect or esteem that is conceived by love. A love that seems deeply that seems deeply motivated by the apostles ministry. A love that comes from Christ and that believers have for Christ. It's a love that results from the death of only one person, Jesus, on behalf of whosoever will. And then Paul gets to verse 16, and he says, don't miss this, from now on, therefore. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in this way. Paul doesn't waste any time, church, as you can see. He doesn't waste any time. Verse 16, but he jumps right in speaking on the blessed reality of a different lens. Specifying that this different lens is a byproduct of a new mind. The apostle in so many words says that when you by faith surrender your life to Christ and join the community of believers, he says, everything changes. It, 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 it changes in a way that you don't or should not judge nor weigh life through the lens of the flesh. So, so much so, church, that, that even when we see our brothers or sisters, our fellow human beings, that even when they show up as the worst of themselves, we should not see or criticize the baggage they are carrying. That's what Paul says. We should not see or criticize the mistakes they've made, the blemishes and imperfections they bear, the inconsistencies they've perfected, the stumbling blocks they've tripped over. He says when 
When our lens has been changed, we should not see nor criticize the experiences that are embarrassing. No, church, Paul says instead of auditing someone else's life, when, when we as Christians look through this different lens, we shouldn't see the size of their sin, but rather the vacancy of an old rugged cross. That's what Paul says, church. Which, which, which suggests, hear me, which suggests we, you and I, are not the stewards, don't miss this, we are not the stewards of our neighbor's outward reformation. Do you hear me, church? Your human assessment on your neighbor has no grounds, no accuracy, and should not be upheld as law. If their habits, character, or lifestyle is contrary to the will or word of God, how about you pray for them? How about you love them? How about you support them? And watch this, and then focus on trying to adjust your own lens so that you can see clearly and be a better example for those that are struggling. Do you hear me, church? I know you wouldn't like this this morning, but I got to tell you. The apostle says, watch this. The apostle says, all relationships have changed. Watch this. Then says, including how we see Jesus Christ. It's, it's interesting, church. Stay with me. It's interesting. But according to Paul's words, he says, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, it's interesting to consider that our writer, Paul, may have known Jesus prior to meeting him as the risen ascended savior on the Damascus road. In fact, there are no legitimate facts that I know of that infer reasonable doubt that this was possible. I mean, after all, Paul has spent significant time in Jerusalem as a student of Rabbi Gamaliel. The fame of the miracle working Messiah was in every newspaper and on every news outlet. The word of Jesus went everywhere. He was discussed on every Facebook post. There were pictures of him plastered across Instagram. Viral videos of him raising the dead and feeding thousands with two fish and five loaves of bread on TikTok. It is very possible that Jesus conducted more private interviews like the one he held with Nicodemus. Who, who is to say that the Apostle Paul never heard Jesus speak before? never saw him perform a miracle, and never came close in proximity to Jesus to feed his curiosity. Even if the Paul, if, even if the apostle didn't actually live or pay a mortgage in Jerusalem, he was always there. He, he was always there for the feast, just like Jesus was. Friends, no matter if Paul had known or encountered Jesus before, or simply had a mental image of him, he says here, I see him differently. See, see, see whatever the case was, the, the apostle's former Jewish ideology led him to create this preconceived notion and reject Christ. But now Paul says that image was incorrect. <laughs> he, he, he says, I, I see him differently. The, the, the workmanship of the father and the death burial and resurrection of the son had changed everything. Yeah. Professor, author, and theologian, Dr. Robert Stamps asks a question that I believe is worth lifting here. He says, how does one remember the resurrection? I can test Paul helps us to somewhat answer this question. We remember the resurrection looking at life, our neighbors and our savior, Jesus Christ, through a different lens. In Paul's mind, he was no longer a self-proclaimed Messiah who lived among the poor and exemplified no authentic rabbi training. In Paul's mind, he was no longer just a kind of a Christ who befriended sinners. In Paul's mind, he was no longer just a radical who chose to stand and fight 
against tradition and the law. In the eyes of Paul, Jesus, he was no longer a criminal who disregarded the rules and regulations of Judaism concerning the keeping of the Sabbath. He was no longer a weird man who sat around with nobodies from Galilee calling them disciples. He was no longer just a man from Nazareth who allowed himself to be handed over to his enemies and be crucified. No, church, the apostle says here, from now on, therefore, I see him differently. Now, now you didn't shout because maybe you don't understand the gravity of his words where he says, from now on, therefore. I got you. It's okay. I'm coming to you here. It's, he says, from now on, therefore. From, from, in other words, from, from this existing present moment on, we regard on one from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. That, that phrase, from now on, therefore implies in its original language that, that something or an event had to have taken place prior to the current lens Paul is looking through. In, in other words, the apostle is simply suggesting because he had this spiritual total solar eclipse experience where the son got in between the father and his sin plague soul and he is now looking through the lens of the cross he now sees Jesus for who he truly is and that ought to be some somebody shout right there thank God that now we have the ability to see life our community our neighbors and our Savior through a different lens and shout of God that is something to rejoice in because we have chosen to look through a different lens, we see ourselves in this community where our neighbors don't adjudicate or referee the many moments we've fallen short in life, but instead when we see each other, we see someone from whom Christ has died. And that ought to be good news this morning. But hold on, hold on. The real shout is when your sibling in Christ chooses to adjust their lens or take the glasses off altogether, that's cool because we have a Savior that just like you and I sees us through a different lens as well. <laughs> and I'm so glad, church, Hallelujah. I'm so glad that he doesn't see us through the lens of outward circumstance. I'm so glad. That when Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see us through the lens of our shortcomings. He doesn't see us through the lens of our sinful nature. I'm so glad he doesn't see us through the lens of empty promises we made, suggesting we would never do it again, and in fact, we did it again and did it well. I'm so glad, church, that when he sees us, he doesn't see us through the lens of failed goals or failed attempts. He doesn't see us how America has historically chosen to see black and brown people. He does not see us as worthless and unlovable. But when Jesus looks at us, he sees us through the lens of his spilled blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole? I wish I had some baptized believers that know it wasn't nothing I said, wasn't nothing I did. It wasn't because I learned scripture or go to church every Sunday. I'm saved and on my way to heaven because Jesus sees me through a different lens. Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Through a different lens, church. Paul says, you want to live a life that is consistent? You want to avoid some of the things you've been tripping over because you're running your race, looking around, instead of looking straight ahead with, your, with the correct lens on? He says... See life, 
See God. See your Savior. See circumstance through the lens of the cross. And it is a direct replication of how Jesus is able to look past all the irrelevant things that we come with, the baggage, and still see his blood. It's a reminder that despite what we've done wrong, it's a reminder that despite how far we've come, that he loves us. And when he looks at you, he sees his spilled blood. Come on and bless God all over the building. pray as we start this new series of looking through a different lens that this will stick to the ribs that you walk away chasing after a different perspective on life than when you look at life when you look at circumstance when you see your neighbor you don't see him or her or the issue as the world sees it, but that you will look through the lens of the cross and see someone just like you who was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. And we're in need of a savior. I pray as we adjust our focus over these next few weeks dealing with this text, that all of us will begin to adjust our frames. We'll begin to stop looking around us and put on the correct lens and look up <laughs> and marvel at the eclipse that took place on Calvary. That Jesus got in between. That he loved us so much that he came after us. That we might be redeemed and reconciled to the Lord. We bless God and we thank God through a different lens. There may be someone here today, you've heard this word, you've heard the words of Paul, and you're contemplating, you're thinking, I need to change my lens. I've been trying to do life looking through the lens of what the culture has deemed as success. I've been trying to do life keeping up with the Jones. I've been trying to do life looking through the lens that if I don't meet this worldly criteria, I must be failing in life. Today, my friend, I offer you a new lens that you might redirect your perspective and your attention on Jesus Christ. And you can do so by simply praying this prayer, Lord, I come as humble as I know how, believing that Jesus Christ died, that he is Lord, believing, oh God, that he rose from the grave with all power in his hands, power to be able to refashion and, re and rework and fix up and prune and cut away so that I ultimately will look more like Christ. That when God looks at me, he'll see me as <laughs> a finished product. And he'll see me as being purchased by his only begotten son's blood. And if you believe that today, can we all agree with, the, with them in prayer by simply saying, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, can we celebrate with you today? Yeah. You prayed that prayer for the very first time. And you meant every word of that. If you're here in this physical space, if you're watching online, our deacons, our ministerial staff is here to accept you, to welcome you in, to 
again, we're just is not, we're not perfect. We love God. We believe his word. We are trying to do the best we can to impact where God has planted us. And if you want to be a part of that, you are more than welcome. Some of you may, may be saying, well, Pastor, I've accepted Christ a long time ago, but I'm, I'm looking for a church home to be fed, to, to grow in the community of believers, to be discipled, to do the work of Christ. Good, we would love to have you. We would love to have you join this band of believers. Again, as we, as we move forward in the work of Christ, for those that are contemplating again here or online, we're praying for you. We're praying for you. It does not take, it does not take a whole lot, except you give God your heart and allow him to do the work. Allow him to grow you. And that's all. God says, give me your heart. Give me your faith. I'll take care of the rest. done what the Lord has required and yet there is still room yet there is still room were you encouraged by this word today I hope you all got something out of it I pray that something was said or done that will encourage your walk that we all are striving to keep our lens adjusted and keep our focus on God I know it's, it's hard when life is rocking you to and fro, it's hard. Keep your focus, keep the correct lens on. I get it. But God is able to supply the strength you need to keep your focus. So hang in there. Hang in there. Shall we stand to be dismissed? Again, very quickly, all of the men of Eastview, very quickly after service, we can meet in the chapel to have a quick conversation. Dear God, we say thank you. Thank you again for what you have done today. Thank you for spending time with us today, oh God. We pray, dear Lord, that the word that has gone forth does not fall on dry, desolate ground, but that it takes root in the hearts and minds of your people, that it germinates and bears good fruit that we might look more like Christ, live more like Christ, and love more like Christ. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Now I'm in the grace of our Lord and Savior, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rests, rule, and abide with us both now and forevermore. Let us all say amen, amen, amen. 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 Go in peace. Love you guys. Until next time, be blessed.